Welcome back to Multilingual Natural Language Processing. In the next three lectures, we are going to talk about translation. Translation is a process of translating text in one language into another language. For example, we can translate a sentence in a source language, English, into a target language, Spanish. Or we can translate a Harry Potter book from English into Spanish. So in, the, in these three lectures, we will uh, cover uh, the topic of machine translation. Uh, today we are, it is going to be an introductory lecture and in the next two classes we will talk about uh, modeling. So our plan for today is uh, to understand the process and the practice of translation. Why is this problem so difficult and uh, why it is important? In, to introduce the task of machine translation uh, to discuss what are existing data sources if we talk about a supervised MT and uh, uh, given a train translation uh, system how do we evaluate it uh, manually or automatically so let's start with the motivation uh, most of you in our class and also the majority of people in the world uh, are multilingual. This means we speak several languages and uh, we can understand the value and, uh, um, of translation and its importance, its huge importance in our life. In general, uh, machine translation is a huge thing for most places in the world and is important for humanity, for education and for commerce. The majority of uh, content on the web, about uh, it's 30% is uh, written in English. And uh, in many countries having access to machine translation provides numerous opportunities for education, for access for information, for access uh, for building businesses and so on. So this is an example of a, a automatic machine translation system or MT system. Uh, this is in particular Google Translate, one of the biggest commercial systems. Translation uh, industry in the world uh, is a huge industry. It, uh, it is uh, uh, approximately $50 billion per year are spent on translation, but the majority of this translation is actually manual translation because um, current machine translation systems are often not on par with the expectations um, uh, of the quality of translation. So um, commercially and uh, politically, uh, MT is an important thing. European Union completely depends on uh, translating uh, many things such as uh, laws and uh, rules uh, across all languages in the European Union. There is a growing need for tra machine translation in Asia, in commercial, educational, social, military domains. According to Wikipedia, Google Translate uh, supports 109 languages to date. And as of 2016, it already claimed uh, over 500 million users and uh, it already translated 100 billion words daily. Uh, machine translation, in the, uh, independent machine translation uh, or separate machine translation engines are uh, also running on uh, social media engines like uh, Facebook and Instagram and they also have millions of users. Uh, eBay makes extensive use of machine translation uh, to enable cross-border trade and so on. Translation is important and uh, you might have seen recent studies that show uh, huge breakthroughs in machine translation. Uh, these breakthroughs uh, often come due to the big advances in uh, deep learning. And uh, this paper or news articles uh, report results that uh, match or even uh, surpass uh, 
the quality of translations by human professionals or they attend human parity. However, it is important to understand that machine translation is a very difficult problem that is uh, far from being solved. And it is still one of the biggest challenges in natural language processing. So why is it so difficult to translate? So let's start with a simple example, uh, a simple mapping of a word to word translation. And in this example, we show, uh, this is an example from the textbook by Jurovsky and Martin, uh, speech and language processing. Uh, we show uh, that uh, there is a, um, so there, are, there is a mapping between uh, concepts and words. So let's look at the uh, gray uh, circles first. So there is a mapping between the word paw and the concept of an animal paw. And uh, uh, there is a mapping between food, for example, and the concept of a human food. And the, there is a mapping of the word food with a separate concept of a bird food and so on. And the, the reason is that there are many ambiguities in language and we discussed in previous lectures that ambiguity is an inherent property of every languages across all levels of linguistic structure. There are lexical, syntactic, semantic and stylistic ambiguities. And it turns out that these ambiguities and the linguistic richness do not map well across languages. And this is what we see in this example when the gray circle corresponds to a mapping of English words to concepts and the blue circles correspond to mapping of French uh, words to the same concepts. And we can see that this mapping is complicated and uh, uh, far from being easy to solve, for example, by using a simple bilingual dictionary. And this is, of course, a simple example of just a couple of words. But if we look at another extreme to understand the uh, full difficulty of uh, the process of translation, we can look at uh, another example from the book. Um, it is an example of translation of a, a passage in Chinese uh, written in 18th century uh, from the uh, Chinese novel, uh, Dream of Red Chamber. And in this slide, you can see uh, the passage itself and its uh, Mandarin phonetics. Now let's analyze why it is difficult to translate this passage into English. So those of you who are Chinese speakers, you can go back one slide and pause and first try to translate what is written in the passage into English. But uh, for others, let's look at uh, the alignment or mapping between the original passage and uh, its, translate, its translation by a professional translator. So here we see that uh, the one sentence passage corresponds to four sentences in English. Uh, on the top, you can see the Chinese version written using uh, English glosses. So glosses is uh, basically literal translations of uh, Chinese words into English words. And uh, if we just read glosses, which means as if we were translating this sentence word by word using a bilingual dictionary, uh, it is probably, uh, this passage wouldn't make much sense to an English speaker. On the bottom, we see the uh, translation of the passage by a professional translator. Now, uh, the blue uh, words colored in blue correspond to words in English or in Chinese that did not have any direct translation in, a, in, a, in another language. And other words that are colored in red are connected with the, the, uh, uh, the sentence in another language using lines. These lines are called alignments. And we can look at, uh, for example, one-to-one -one alignment from the Chinese word think 
to the English translation thoughts. And we can see also one-to-many alignment, for example, from the Chinese noun compound on bed top to a, a single word in English, lay. Uh, now, when we see this crossing of uh, the lines, uh, they signal us that the order of words between the two languages is different. So there is a difference in the order of subject, verb, object, and uh, others, uh, which again make monotonous translation differently, uh, difficult. So uh, we can see that there are many different levels of, uh, of uh, the mental process that the translator had to take to translate this sentence. And the, also we can see clearly the differences between English and Chinese in the word order, in the, uh, the way different concepts, are, in lexicalization of uh, different concepts, in the uh, grammar, in the, um, the mapping between words and phrases. So for example, uh, Chinese does not have or have few uh, definite and indefinite articles, while English uh, has the concept of definiteness. So we see that all uh, def uh, definite and indefinite articles a and the do not have a mapping. English has a complex system of verbs that are not mapped uh, into um, Chinese, for example, had be become or turned to. On the other hand, uh, there are noun compounds that are translated to single words. And in addition, the translator really had to understand the concept and the culture to be able to uh, translate these sentences. For example, the phrase on bed top uh, is not clear unless it is translated to a more clear to us verb lay. And there is a poetic translation also, for example, um, bamboo tip, plantain leaf, uh, would not be clear to an English speaker, so it was simplified into bamboos and uh, plantains. So, and, and there are many, many additional details that you can see here that exemplify uh, why the process of translation is difficult even for humans and uh, why it would be difficult for us to model it uh, computationally. Now, you may think that uh, Chinese and English are very different. They're different typologically. And this is a novel which is uh, which has uh, which is poetic, and uh, it was written a long time ago. So what happens if we translate between similar languages, and in a new domain? And you can see that uh, in these translations, even English and German uh, languages from uh, same language family uh, also have uh, the same kind of challenges. Basically, mapping between languages is uh, usually very difficult. And to summarize, uh, there are difficulties at uh, lexical levels. There are difficulties in different morphology. For example, when we translate from English to Cantonese, uh, or from when we translate from English, which is an uh, isolated language, which means that uh, there are only few morphemes per words to some agglutinative language like Turkish, uh, the translation would be complicated. And uh, the level of uh, syntax, I'm missing here a bullet of syntax, uh, there are dif difficulties in translating, for example, from SOV languages or SVO languages like English or German into SOV languages like Japanese or Hindi, or VSO languages like uh, Tagalog. And this is not only the order of subject, verb, and object, this is also order of in, uh, adjectives and nouns, 
and the other syntactic variations. In addition, at semantic level, uh, languages differ in the level of um, context in communication. So, uh, Western European languages are generally considered uh, low context languages, which means that they mark pronouns explicitly. They explicitly mark who did what, uh, to whom, and do not count on the listener to infer it from the context. Um, in contrast, uh, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese, for example, are considered high context languages which means they rely on hearer to figure out uh, the context. And this is why, for example, uh, pronouns can be omitted. All this leads to misalignment that make it impossible to translate uh, sentences uh, monotonously. And there are additional uh, challenges like, uh, like the lack of uh, training data, uh, the lack of common sense knowledge that we usually don't mention in text, for example, that an elephant is bigger than a mouse. Uh, also understanding the context, connotations, who are the people involved and so on. So all of these levels uh, make translation challenging. Okay, so uh, there are, uh, now we will quickly look at the history of uh, modeling of translation because uh, in the majority of the class we will talk about uh, contemporary technique. So this will be a brief overview. So there are three classical method, methods for uh, tackling the problem of machine translation. Uh, these are direct translation, uh, transfer-based methods and interlingua. And, uh, altogether, they are composed this fa famous vacuum uh, triangle. So when we talk about tra direct translation, uh, we, we talk about direct uh, translation of the lexical items, so at surface level, translation of words. And when we talk about transfer approaches, we talk about the transfer of um, linguistic structure, the uh, transfer of syntactic or semantic representation. And finally, when we talk about a third interlingua method, we assume that there is some general uh, mapping from a surface level text to a meaning representation. And then this meaning representation is shared across languages and then we would generate from this meaning representation directly into the surface level uh, form in the target language. So historically uh, machine translation in the 60s started from direct translation or rule-based transla uh, translation. So um, by and large this process can be summarized as follows. So we have a source language and then we do some word by word uh, dictionary translation and we rely on predefined linguistic knowledge for simple reordering or morphological processing. So we would have an input sentence and we will go over it word by word. We will do morphological analysis and maybe we'll just strip prefixes and suffixes if it's a concatenative morphology. And then we will use a translation dictionary, which it was constructed manually to translate every word. And then we can do local reordering based on syntactic rules. And then uh, maybe uh, now apply prefixes and suffixes based on the target language morphology. And this is how we would generate a target language. And this is how a rule looked like. So this uh, really, uh, small uh, rule uh, describes how to translate the word, uh, words uh, much and many into Russian. And uh, what it does is uh, it has a lot of if else conditions, which, is, uh, which try to account um, to take into account all possible contexts of the word and different translations within those contexts. So clearly this approach cannot scale and uh, 
very quickly. The field has transferred to transfer-based approaches. And towards the 90s, the field has transferred to statistical approaches from the rule-based approaches. So there is a, also diversity of transfer-based approaches that was explored. And the general idea of transfer-based approaches is to apply contrastive knowledge about uh, or knowledge about uh, differences between the two languages. And uh, when we have raw data, we can make um, kind of a computational decision also uh, which differences or which linguistic layer we would like to focus on. So we can uh, try to encode the differences between the languages, for example, at lexical level, but also we can go through a syntactic transfer, which means that, for example, we have an input sentence in German and we would create, for example, a dependency parse tree for this uh, sentence. And then um, we would uh, translate from a structured representation of the input sentence into the target language. And uh, uh, potentially these types of approaches uh, could be useful for pairs of languages with divergent syntactic structure. Now, instead of going through the source language syntactic structure, we could potentially go through a target language syntactic structure. So to build a translation from a source sentence, for example, into a target language uh, dependency parse, and then uh, to turn it into a sentence. And then there is a question which one to choose. The answer would be uh, wherever you can build a better parser. And of course, there are uh, many other options. So we could go uh, from a tree to tree translation. And uh, uh, then we could think about uh, encoding semantic representation directly from text and then going uh, from it to text or via uh, some structured representation um, and so on. So all these slides basically summarized all possible options of um, translating or transferring information by focusing by divergences between languages and different levels of uh, linguistic representations. And on the top level, theoretically, we could have an interlingua layer, which will have uh, general representations. Unfortunately, uh, this ideal approach is uh, not feasible and uh, was not shown to be feasible uh, because we do not yet know what is this ideal representation and we don't have uh, techniques for doing good semantic or high quality sem computational semantic analysis. Uh, sentences. Now, uh, today with uh, massively multilingual machine translation systems with uh, neural networks, uh, researchers are uh, basically trying to build models that uh, somehow represent the noisy or rough version of interlingua when we combine multiple languages into a single computational analyzer. But this is an active uh, research direction. Overall, uh, as I mentioned, historically, um, rule-based approaches were used around 60s and then around 90s. The field has fully transferred to statistical approaches in which the dominant paradigm was called phrase-based translation that focused on transfer at lexical level. And uh, in general, uh, practically, it was shown that the highest quality machine translation systems are usually obtained through learning correspondences between the um, surface forms of languages. Okay, so now uh, uh, let's talk about translation data. So where does translation data come from? And in this slide, uh, I show a very simple example between two imaginary languages. You can find out what are those languages from this paper. And the, 
uh, this example shows uh, training data for a machine translation system, which is called a parallel corpus. So a parallel corpus is a collection of translated sentences. For example, if we have a book such as Harry Potter, we would run computational techniques, statistical techniques uh, to align between the sentences in the uh, two books. And our training corpus would be uh, two files uh, of the same length, same, num same number of lines, in which every line is a parallel translation of the sentence to sentence. So a machine translation system learns from a bunch of examples of translated sentences. Fortunately, there are a lot of organic ways in which uh, these parallel corpora can be created. So there are governments, as I mentioned, that create translation, for example, to all European languages. And there are uh, countries that have several official languages, for example, uh, Canada, and then many documents uh, have to be translated uh, into, uh, have to have parallel versions into, um, in English and in French, for example, parliamentary proceedings. Uh, there are many sources of newspaper translations. So very often when you read the newspaper in your native language, you might find uh, also a, English variant of the same newspaper. And uh, there are uh, existing techniques for mining parallel corpora, for searching basically uh, such websites and crawling such websites that uh, have um, documents and their translations. Unfortunately, for the majority of world's languages, um, such translations do not exist. So this is where the imbalance come from and this is what we call uh, low resource languages. So there are languages like English, French, or Spanish, or um, English Chinese or English Arabic that have millions of examples of parallel data. But there are hundreds of African languages that almost don't have uh, such a presence of manually translated parallel data on the web. So what are alternative sources of corpora? Uh, it turns out that uh, the Bible is the biggest multi-parallel corpus. So this is a corpus translated into, six, Bible was translated into 698 languages. And of course, we cannot build a high quality machine translation system for translating news uh, from one language into another using a uh, Bible as a training data. However, uh, these sources of uh, par parallel uh, examples of parallel sentences can be the only available data for those languages. And this could be an important seed for developing few short approaches or low resource approaches to machine translation. So additional ways to mine for parallel corpora could be uh, looking for books, especially older books that don't have um, uh, proprietary uh, restrictions. And there are other examples such as uh, parallel corpora extracted from menus and uh, even parallel corpora that are extracted from noisy social uh, media data. So here is an example of uh, an interesting paper on mining uh, data from uh, Weibo uh, social um, engine. So where can you find uh, many sources of uh, parallel data? And what would be, if you want to build your own machine translation system, where can you look for parallel data? So this website called uh, Opus is a very large collection of, of all kinds of data in all kinds of domain, including the uh, Europarl or parliamentary proceedings, as I mentioned, but also spoken language translation, for example, translations of TED Talks to uh, dozens of languages, 
and translations of uh, books and manuals and so on. So we cover the topics of what is machine translation, why it is hard, and what are existing data sets and how to mine for them. And the last topic of today's lecture is um, how to understand what is a good translation. So given a corpus of parallel sentences, uh, we, train, or we train a translation model. At inference time, we would have a sentence which is a held out sentence, most likely because of the sparsity, most likely our translation system had never seen this sentence in its training data. And our model needs to output a translation into another language. So uh, how do we know that our model works well? It turns out that machine translation evaluation is also very hard and is a research uh, topic on its own. Even uh, human translators, uh, and it is hard for them to understand what is a good translation and what is not a good translation. Um, they need to understand the source language, they need to know uh, how to speak the target language, they need to have a knowledge about the topic of the text that is being translated. They need to have a knowledge about the culture, the values, traditions, and expectations of speakers in both languages and so on. So uh, kind of objectively evaluating uh, what is a better translation is, always, is often very hard. In addition, there is an issue of language variability, so there are many possible good translation and then how would we detect how would we choose which system for example which is a, if we have a two high quality systems which system is better and uh, further human evaluation is subjective so given two good systems uh, there can be a lot of disagreement between people who think uh, about and of who uh, value different aspects of fluency or adequacy of translation of, uh, more than others. Okay, so I mentioned the concept, concepts of adequacy and fluency. So these are dimensions and language we usually evaluate translations manually. So adequacy correspond to how does the um, output convey the same uh, kind of uh, does the output convey the same meaning as the input sentence? So some kind of mapping between the source and the target. We call it the adequacy of translation. Are there parts of the message that uh, got lost uh, or added or distorted? And the second dimension is fluency or the quality of the target language model. Is the output good and uh, fluent in the target language? This involves basically checking for grammaticality of the outputs, uh, of the correctness of uh, the choices of metaphors or idiomatic word choices and so on. And uh, in the human evaluation, uh, for example, we could ask people to use a Likert scale for uh, separately for adequacy and separately for fluency to Kind of estimate what is the quality of translation and then to measure uh, agreement between human annotators. Another way to, to conduct human evaluation is to attempt to run this system. So uh, this is a snapshot from a, a human evaluation tool that basically uh, compared uh, five systems. And uh, uh, given five possible translations, uh, you as annotator need to choose basically which translation system is run first, which translation system is run second, and so on. So this is a comparative translation to be able to run overall on aggregate for many sentences by many annotators, which translation system is on average better. Additional ways to conduct human evaluation are, uh, can be post-editing effort, uh, which means 
how much effort, for example, how much time it takes for a human translator to fix the output of a machine translation system to turn it into a good translation. And uh, another option is to do a task-based evaluation. For example, uh, if we plug a machine translation system into an additional task, for example, cross-lingual question answering, cross-lingual information retrieval, how well it, uh, will it work? So as uh, you can probably guess, human evaluation is very expensive and very difficult and also uh, subjective, although it is the best way to evaluate uh, systems or to understand the outputs of the systems. And this is why we resort to proxies. And there was a bunch of automatic evaluation techniques that uh, have been proposed. So this slide lists just a few of them. There, was, there were many more. So precision-based methods, uh, blue or NIST scores, uh, F-score-based methods, for example, Meteor, that is a variant of blue that also accounts for uh, synonyms and uh, antonyms and paraphrases and so on. Uh, error rates, border error rate, term error rates, uh, syntactic or semantic, so linguistically motivated metrics. And uh, in recent years, uh, more and more attention is given to embedding-based uh, evaluation metrics. For example, BERT score that looks at contextual embeddings or these, which I, which I bolded, are more popular specifically in the field of machine translation. So the one that you have probably heard and the one that is most prominent in machine translation is a blue score that was introduced in uh, already almost 20 years ago uh, in 2002. And since then it has been a standard uh, evaluation metric in uh, thousands of machine translation papers. So here I describe uh, how we calculate blue. It is a simple metric. It counts the number of uh, n-gram overlaps between the machine translation output and the reference translation. So the concept of reference translation is important. We have some manual translations that were translated by humans and we compare the output of the machine translation to the manual translations. Now what we want to do is we want to compute the precision of uh, overlapping n-grams. So we will extract unigrams, y-grams, trigrams, four grams, and we'll calculate the precision of those n-grams that are uh, in the overlap. So the intuition behind this metric is that um, we account for adequacy of translation by looking at uh, word precision and we account for fluency of translation by calculating n-gram precision for higher order n-grams. And uh, in this metric we do not account for recall and it is natural because uh, recall is difficult because there are many possible a good translation for one sentence, but usually we have only one reference translation. Although it is possible and the blue becomes more trustworthy when we have multi-reference translations. And now to compensate for the lack of uh, accounting for recall, we add an additional term, which is a brevity penalty. Basically it penalizes translations that are too short. Because uh, naturally, if we calculate the, the precision scores will be higher for shorter sentences. So the final score is the geometric average of the uh, n-gram precision uh, multiplied by the brevity penalty. And uh, uh, there is an implicit assumption here that uh, blue is calculated on a very large test corpus. So for example, 2000 sentences and uh, it is much less trustworthy when we estimate blue, for example, calculate blue on uh, just a few sentences. So how do we know that an automatic metric uh, is uh, good? How do we know if it is correct? 
uh, in generate, uh, we prefer automatic metrics if they are very fast to calculate, if they are tunable, if they are consistent. Uh, but most important thing is that we want to know that uh, our automatic metric has high correlation with human judgments, with human decisions of what is considered as a good translation versus not a good translation. And it was shown historically, this is an old plot, that uh, blue has uh, um, high correlation with uh, machine translation systems, and it is very high to, uh, very fast to calculate, and this is why, it has, and, and also there are not many better systems that were, uh, that convinced the field. So blue was considered a state of the art for many years. However, um, in the recent ACL, ACL 2020, uh, there was a paper which, um, this paper, and I recommend to you guys to read it, uh, that uh, discussed um, many critiques of blue and uh, conducted a very thorough analysis of, uh, of the weaknesses of blue and what we are missing when we evaluate and we report our results using uh, only uh, work-based precision metrics such as blue. And uh, there are multiple kind of weaknesses, for example, Blue does not take into account the relevance of words. Uh, so, because it looks uh, kind of, it doesn't have the weighting of what concepts are important or less important. It operates on a uh, local level. So there is a kind of a measure of intersection of uh, short engrams, but we don't know whether factuality is preserved. Uh, these scores are, uh, meaningless if we are trying to kind of think about them as percentages. These are not percentages and also they are not comparable if we calculate blue on different corpora. And the human translators score uh, low on blue. So and the, those facts, that those are not facts that are mentioned in this paper, but the general knowledge uh, about the weaknesses of blue. However, this paper discussed additional weaknesses, um, specifically that blue is uh, sensitive to outliers, that uh, it correlates less with human judgments uh, if our systems become of higher and higher quality. And the, uh, it compared several embedding-based systems with blue, and the conclusion was that there is a recommendation to the field to move to uh, these evaluation methods. Okay, so um, where can you read the papers about machine translation? So there are thousands of papers that are published in uh, machine translation tracks in the main NLP conferences, ACL, NACL, MNLP, uh, and others. And there are very large workshops that particularly focus on machine translation. Uh, the biggest of them is already a conference, the conference of uh, automatic machine translation, WMT. And there are also IWSLT, which is a workshop on um, uh, spoken language translation and others. And uh, in these competitions, there are uh, multiple systems compete and, and the real world systems in, including commercial systems. And this is an example of a matrix of evaluation, I think from 2018, that showed the blue scores for uh, machine translation systems between uh, multiple morphologically rich or morphologically poor languages. So this is the end of the introductory lecture on machine translation and the discussion of uh, translation data and evaluation. And uh, here is uh, your discussion task for tomorrow's lecture. So we want to understand uh, the process of translation and why it is difficult. And uh, one way to understand the, kind of the difficulty and also uh, the weaknesses of uh, of translation 
uh, of an existing translation system is uh, to use it as a pivot language. So to, to use back translation. So your task would be to pick a four line of a, a poem or your favorite poem in English. And then use Google Translate to back translate this poem. So which means translate this poem into another language, a pivot language, and then translate it back into English. And you can try to uh, experiment with very similar and high resource languages, very similar languages to English and the high resource languages such as Spanish, so translate from English into Spanish and back to English. Or you can try to go from English into L1, which is typologically divergent from English, for example, Japanese, and then to L2, which is a typologically divergent from English and Japanese, for example, um, Hebrew, and then translate it back into English. And your task in the, our discussion would be to compare the original poem and, poem and its back translated version and to share your observations. And uh, I give in this slide several examples of uh, points that we could discuss. Thank you and see you tomorrow in the class.